Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, today we want to talk about the upcoming Windows 11 and ask this fundamental question. Is Windows 11 time to switch to Linux or is it time to buy new hardware? Well, what do we mean by this? If you have a look at the system requirements, one of the requirements of Windows 11 is TPM 2.0. Zero. Now, I don't get into a lot of the hardware components on computers as much, and so I had to dig into the uh, internet there and figure out what exactly is TPM 2.0. And what I would like to do is I'd like to suggest if you are looking to switch over, like if you're looking to upgrade your computer from Windows 10 and you're looking at Windows 11 and it says, hey, you can't run Windows 11 on this computer, I want to encourage you to drop Windows and switch to Linux instead. Your other alternative is to buy new hardware. The reason I'm going to come to this conclusion is what we're going to have a look at here. Now, first, let's go ahead and discuss this. Can everybody switch to Linux? Well, yes and no. It really depends. If your workflow is dependent on Windows, your company is really the one responsible to provide you that hardware. If you work in freelance type things, I promise you, you can switch to Linux. I do a lot of things in freelance. I do graphics. I do web. I do a lot of little odds and ends. I produce books. I do everything in Linux. Now, can you use Photoshop? Can you use Microsoft Word? No. Get away from the idea that you have to use those applications if you are the one in charge of your work. Get away from those ideas because I got news for you. Linux can run only office. It can run LibreOffice. It can run about a dozen other alternatives to Word. Some of those work really well with Word documents. Some of those, maybe not as much. Frankly, 99.9% .9 of you Using Word can get away with LibreOffice. And OnlyOffice proclaims to have more support for the docx file format. So consider that. GIMP is a good alternative to Photoshop. There's a few other things out there as well that could. But the fact of the matter is, there are a lot of things that you can do. Get away from the idea of, I have to use this software package and shift instead to, I have to accomplish this task and then figure out how to accomplish this task. So we're gonna start our discussion here at this OMG Ubuntu article. Hot topic, why Windows 11 could be good news for Ubuntu. Really, this should be good news for any Linux distribution, but this is OMG Ubuntu. So obviously, they said, hey, this is, could be good news for Ubuntu. I might add Linux Mint, and if you're watching this video and you're saying, uh, Windows 11, I, I really can't afford a new computer, or I can't find a new computer, I'd steer you more towards Linux Mint instead. It's going to probably be a little bit more comfortable of an experience. Ubuntu is a little bit more unusual from a workflow standpoint from a Windows system. But they go into this article talking about a lot of the elements here. First and foremost, uh, the requirements say that you need a modern 64-bit processor, no more 32-bit versions. I'm not sure if Windows 10 had a 32 bit, and I, I just don't know. They wanted a dual core and clocked at least one gigahertz. That's fairly standard, but uh, in fact, I, I really don't think that you're gonna find a computer in the last decade that doesn't have at least that. They want four gigs of RAM. That is going to be a lot harder. I have Windows computers or computers I bought with Windows on them, they're running Linux now, that do not even have four gigs of RAM and you cannot even upgrade them to four gigs of RAM. It mandates a resolution of 1366 by 768. Mm, that is a fairly standard minimum resolution for today. Good, so far, so good, the article says. However, it is only possible to install Windows 11 on hardware that is UEFI, that probably isn't a big deal. Secure boot, probably also not a big deal, but the big one is TPM 2.0. That is the important part because this means that all of the hardware has to be generally newer than five or six years old. The fact of the matter is, though, you can get a whole lot more life out of a computer. Now, where are all of the, 
How dare you, Greta Thunberg environmentalists, yelling at Microsoft for encountering piles more e-waste. People are going to have to throw out their computers. And if you are running a system that is older than that or just, just doesn't have those system requirements, you are either going to have to buy new hardware, which, by the way, is getting very expensive and hard to get right now because of chip shortages, or you're going to need to find another alternative, such as maybe switching to Linux. And that is really something that we want to talk about here. Now, I wanted to look into what is TPM 2.0. I head on over to Wikipedia, read through. Uh, the basic TLDR is that this is a built-in encryption module onto the computer, which will allow the computing platform to do a lot of calculations to make sure things have not been tampered with. For the most part, that is okay. But when you get on down to the bottom and we start asking the questions I like to ask, I do like this, uh, the point of criticism here. So TGC has faced resistance to the deployment of TPM 2.0. This is TPM in general um, in some areas where some authors see it possible uses, uh, uses not specifically related to trusted computer, which may raise privacy concerns. The concerns include the abuse of remote validation of software. So if you remember, we're in a parenthetical here for a moment. If you remember when Windows 10 was first rolling out, several people had older versions of Microsoft Office deleted. Some people had files on their computer deleted. What was going on there is the system was looking at different things and going, oh, this doesn't seem to match something. Let's just delete it. So Windows is literally saying what you can and cannot look at on your system. Return to the article. Um, the concerns include the abuse of remote validation software where the manufacturer and not the user who owns the computing system decides what software is allowed to run. In other words, we want to block you from running this particular piece of software, so you just can't run it. doesn't matter if the system could otherwise do so. I mean, really, a computer is zeros and ones, but when you start adding complexity of checking home and, and checking if you want something to be able to run, we start having a lot of differences. And possible ways to follow actions taken by the user being recorded in a database in a matter that is completely untectable to the user. So I look at what this is. This actually comes from the Free Software Foundation uh, in June 29th, 2011 from Richard Stallman. So he asks here, can you trust your computer? And he starts out by asking, who should your computer take orders from? Most people think their computer should obey them and not someone else. With a plan they call trusted computing, large media corporations, including the movie companies and record companies, together with computer companies such as Microsoft and Intel, are planning to make your computer obey them instead of you. Microsoft's version of scheme is called Palladium. Proprietary programs have included malicious features before, but this plan would make that universal. He goes into the proprietary software. He looks at the Kaza music sharing software, which had some DRM. Of course, um, when Windows 10 rolled out, uh, Napster, which is still a thing, you download files in the WMA format instead of MP3 for some reason. And when you grab those, Microsoft pulled the DRM to play Windows media audio files. I think that's what WMA is from the computer, meaning that you had to have an active internet connection to play WMA files. The support forums on Napster said, just don't upgrade your computer. Um, it's Windows 10. And at that time, Windows 10, you didn't have a choice. You had to upgrade your computer. And so the DRM is locked onto an online platform that checks home before each file. Why is it checking home? Is it recording file names? Is it recording the music that you're looking at? Is there something else in there that is pinging off of Microsoft? Is such data being stored and analyzed? These are good questions that we shouldn't even have to ask because there's no reason that an audio file shouldn't just play offline mode on my computer. He goes into all these and talks about trusted computing, where trusting computing is where there is something, and he's talking here about the TPM. This is way back when this was kind of first implemented, where the TPM 
does checks to see if things are working. He, instead of calling it trusted computing, he calls it treacherous computing. And in this, what he's talking about is having some element of the computer locking files to your computer. This is not out of the norm. This is the way a lot of your downloads work. For example, uh, I'm not sure if you can anymore, but you used to, if you purchased a movie from Amazon, this is before the prime days, you could download that only two times, but you couldn't transfer that file to another computer. It was logging something about that computer. Maybe it was TPM, which I don't think was implemented yet. Maybe there was something else in there, but it prevented that file from being played anywhere on your computer. Now that might be fine if you have one little computer and you don't do much with it. I have like 10 computers around here and sometimes this computer that I'm working on is busy doing something and so I wanna move a file over to another one. This is why I like DRM free books, I like DRM free movies, I like DRM free music because I have no restrictions about where it's being used so long as I am diligent to make backups of my files. But he talks about how treacherous computing based on this TPM software could actually be used to lock access to content from others and even from you. In other words, if you were to find illegal information and want to leak it to a journalist, that illegal information could not be shared with anybody else because it lacks the security keys written by your own device. So this is a fascinating read through. We're not going to look at it, but what I did want to do is I want to look up more about this Palladium from Microsoft. So this is from the Electronic Privacy Information Center. So Microsoft Palladium, next generation secure computing base. So the docs cover Palladium privacy unique identifier issues. So Epic has documents from the National Institute of Standards and Technologies under the Freedom from Information Act describing Microsoft Palladium. The documents describe Palladium's application for digital rights management and note that the technology embeds unique machine identifiers, thus raising risks that user behavior may be subject to traffic analysis. Issues raised by Palladium, which is now known as Next Generation Secure Computing Base, are similar to privacy problems with the controversial Intel Pentium serial number. So they go into all of this. In June uh, 2002, Microsoft released information regarding the new Palladium initiative. And this is 2002. This is Windows XP era for people thinking this is something new. So Palladium is a system that combines software and hardware controls to create trusted computing platform. In doing so, it would establish an unprecedented level of control over users and their computers. Palladium could place Microsoft as the gatekeeper of identification and authentication. It's what we saw with Windows 10, removing software it deemed inappropriate. It could remove software that it thinks could be pirated, which sure could be pirated, or it could be some weird niche software that you had to download to use some obscure application or you know piece of hardware that you happen to have. I, I actually do have some contracts I work with with some people where they're selling things that are weird and proprietary and need some form of external application that they allow a download to. Well, if these guys get locked out of that, well, you can't use your expensive equipment anymore. Very interesting. Additionally, systems embedded in both software and hardware could control access to content, thereby creating unique digital rights management schemes that track users and control the use of media. And these, uh, Microsoft ex uh, expects to have implement, um, elements to the system in place by 2004. And indeed, now if you go out to college and they're having the ebook, just buy the PDF ebook, it's only $80. It's cheaper than that $300 textbook but you can only use it on your system and it's only good for you know 18 months usually. Which means if you like keeping track of your college textbooks like I do, and uh, I can go back and pull off the textbooks off the shelf that I learned from in college to this day, but all these people being pushed into these e-platforms instead, you're buying for $80 something. Now you have to understand, I went to college, when I went to college, textbooks themselves were $80. Now the textbooks are exorbitantly priced. They, I guess $80 was probably exorbitantly priced then too. But the textbooks are exorbitantly priced. They're still the same price, only you can't resell it. And it doesn't even work after 18 months. Very interesting. Here's some key 
elements of the system. The system purports to stop viruses by preventing the running of malicious programs. I think that Microsoft failed in that. It is the most virus-ridden OS of all. The system will store personal data with an encrypted folder. The system will depend on hardware that is either digital signature or tracking number. The system will filter spam. No, I guess they abandoned that one. And there's no hope. No hope, no hope, no hope at all. Um, the system, well, let's see. Uh, the system has a personal uh, information sharing agent called My Man. Well, that sounds frightening. Let me go talk to my man in the back. Yeah. You know, System will incorporate DRM technologies for media files of all types, music, documents, email communications. Additionally, the system purports to transmit data within the computer via encrypted paths. So that's really what we're talking about when we get into TPM. Now, you have to understand the TPM 2.0 standard was finalized in 2019. It's only about two years ago. Which means a lot of people, when they're being presented with Windows 11 and their systems like, we got to get ourselves up to date, you are either going to have to make the jump off of Windows altogether, or you're going to have to go out and buy new hardware. Where are all the people complaining that Microsoft is going to be sending millions and possibly billions of computers to the trash heap? Because people do not know you can take that same computing equipment and get even more stuff done with Linux without buying new hardware, without buying the license fees, and without having an operating system that is spying on you and sending everything back to the cloud. These are good questions. So when Windows 11 comes, are you going to finally switch to Linux? Or are you going to go out and spend money and buy new hardware and throw your perfectly good machine into the trash can? That's a good question. Now, if you're already using Linux, I would please encourage you pass this video on to other people. Maybe they didn't even know their computer is doing all these things. Now, I do have some excellent videos on this channel. I just did one last week, an updated video last week on installing Linux onto a computer starting with Windows 10. So if you have a system that's nagging about Windows 11 and saying, oh, not compatible, throw this perfectly good, good working computer away and go buy a new one. If you're like, no, bro, I'm not going to do that. I had an excellent video. I'll go ahead and link that in the description here. So you can go ahead and you can watch that video as well. And with that, guys, thank you for watching, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software, that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.